characters, spoof adverts and mock documentaries years before such things were common TV currency. We all have battered copies of her script book, up to you, Porky. Indeed, it's uh, no exaggeration to say this is where our education in comedy sketch writing began. Yes, she's that old. <laughs> Uh, we've recently been lucky enough to work with Victoria in our film, The League of Gentlemen's Apocalypse. We've been asked not to mention the film, which opens on April 22nd in cinemas nationwide. <laughs> so we won't. Uh, Victoria plays the part of Queen Mary II, which is appropriate casting for the reigning monarch of British comedy. She actually took the throne by force after a bloody palace coup in which she deposed the former Queen John Inman. <laughs> To be honest, she wasn't the first choice, but Jade Goody's doing Lady Macbeth for Simon Russell Beale, so... <laughs> the part of the Queen was woefully underwritten by us, but Victoria did us proud by giving a wonderful performance, which you'll all be able to enjoy if you get the DVD and go down to deleted scenes. <laughs> Well, I actually couldn't think of anything. I had a cold, so I asked Victoria uh, if she could uh, write something for me, and I have the words uh, right here, so if I may. To whoever ends up doing this because the Beverly sisters were too dear. <laughs> Say what you like, they don't know who I am anyway. The last time I was there, someone leant over and said, are you still doing your poems, Pam? <laughs> Anyway, just read what's on the other side of this paper, you'll be all right. All right. <laughs> Victoria Wood is a genius and a national institution. <laughs> Not only is she beautiful to look at, but her continuing dominance of British comedy is guaranteed, and the guaranteed is underlined. <laughs> Let's take a look at Queen Victoria in action. Here we are, then. We made it. We're out of the house. She's excellent, stand-up comedian. What have we got people right at the top? Oh, yes, a lot of mis... Oh, you're waving, hello. You must splash out for a better seat next time. <laughs> Everybody in my school had really greasy hair. We made seal skin look dry and unmanageable. <laughs> Spots, specks, terrible at sex, lay there like a stunned gazelle. I was 33 when it dawned on me that girls could move as well. It's the identification. We've, we've all been there. Anyway, I know I'm different sizes in different shops. 16 in some shops, 18 in some shops. In Gap, I'm only a size 12 because they're American. In Marks and Spencer's, I'm only a size 3 because they don't want to upset anybody. And, um, <laughs> in Top Shop, my hip set off an alarm as I go through. <laughs> she sold out for 15 nights, sold out the Albert Hall. And, and that, to me, is some achievement. When they asked me to come back again, I said, well, I will have to have a set because I have to have something between me and that huge organ because it's very distracting. <laughs> It was an enormous place for two weeks. People coming in droves, in buses from all over the, all over the country. But now they're all over the place, these makeover programmes, and the people who present them are now considered to be sort of stars in their own right, and they're not most of them, they're just builders. And the only difference between those builders and our builders is that those builders have turned up. I happened just to pass the stage door, and there she was with a little bag, putting it into the back of her car, and driving away on her own. <laughs> and I just thought that just shows sort of the remarkable magic of her, of this sort of private, interesting person who can be so uh, gorgeously um, accessible on stage. But the last time I went into City, I was sitting there like this, and there was a couple across the aisle having sex. But this being a British trade, nobody said anything. <laughs> when they finished, they both lit up a cigarette, and this woman said, up and said Excuse me, I think I find this is a non smoking company. <laughs> She's not only a stand-up act, she's the best sit-down act as well, isn't she? She gets to be on that piano. Hello, my name's Corinna, and I work in a salon. What comes over in, in a writing and, and, and in a stand-up is the rhythm of the North, and it's the, it's the, it's the way that certain words are used. Um, and it's the accent, too, of course, that slightly lugubrious uh, uh, Lancashire accent. <laughs> and I say, who these towels are awful. They ought to be more tufty. Is the water comfy? Is it not too hot? She really crafts these songs. They're not just, you know, something comic and you, you dismiss it. Well, to write music and lyrics and perform to that uh, standard is something which is very rare indeed. In fact, I, I was trying to think, who else in the world do I know who, 
who, who ever does it that standard. The only one I can think of is Cole Porter at the moment. Had my shower, I'm off shampooed, I'm feeling in a funny mood. Don't blame it on the altitude, I'm feeling in the mood tonight. Comedy, my only goal, my food and drink, my heart and soul. I've had two jellies and a sausage roll, and I'm feeling in the mood tonight. Very much like Joyce Grenfell, she had an ear for for things that were going on in ordinary, everyday life. I think my favourite is Let's Do It. It's something, something ballad of then two people's names, but Let's Do It is how I know it. I mean, Let's Do It is like the song of the century. <laughs> let's do it, let's do it, do it till our hearts go boo. Go native, creative, living in the living room. This folly is jolly, bend me over backwards on me hostess trolley. Let's do it, let's do it tonight. In the 80s, uh, my girlfriend at the time, her mum, used to say, beat me on the bottom with the Woman's Weekly almost every time I saw her. Not weekly, not weekly, beat me on the bottom with the Woman's Weekly, but certainly did it there and she's still doing it today. Uh, we've only known Victoria for a short while but here's one of her oldest friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a brilliant comedian, Mr Ted Robbins. <laughs> Hello, my name's Ted Robbins and I was one of the first men to warm Victoria Wood up. <laughs> It was in the early 80s, and she and Julie were starring in their first series for Granada Television, Wood and Walters, and I managed to persuade the producer that I could do a good job keeping the studio audience jolly during the breaks between sketches. Now, things didn't really get off to a very good start. Uh, the studio audience went in the first flush of youth, unlike the audience here today. On the way in, one of the Zimmer frames jackknifed. Um, <laughs> it was... I'm not very good, but I'm the best in the price range, I promise you. <laughs> I, I, literally, I had about three gags. Uh, the first one was, what's the difference between roast beef and pea soup? Any idiot can roast beef. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Barry. <laughs> and I think my best gag at the time was, a woman goes out for a few drinks with her mates and she comes back late at night with a duck under her arm. She stands staring at her husband. She says, what do you think of me pig? He said, you idiot, that's a duck. She said, I was talking to the duck. <laughs> so... Act. So, in desperation, I did the only thing that any self-respecting red-nosed comic would do. I took me trousers off. This is true. Uh, and Victoria, to this day, says whenever she meets me, she can't help thinking of me with me trousers around my ankles. She's only human. And, uh, <laughs> that's right, girls, once you've tried fat, you never look back. And, uh, <laughs> Victoria said to me, uh, you're a real sex symbol, Ted. I said, do, you, do I remind you of Brad Pitt? She said, you're more like his brother, Seth. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> more recently, I met up with Vic when, as part of her big, fat documentary, she came back to her home county of Lancashire, where I live now, where men are men and the motorway is cobbled. And... Uh, <laughs> She took part in a phone-in on my radio show up there, BBC Radio Lancashire, 95.5 FM, and um, <laughs> a massive round there. And we had lots of calls, and uh, after all the predictable banter about size and weight and jokes about fat and things like that, you know, the usual jokes about, you know, my doctor examined me, he said, you're obese, I said, I'd like a second opinion, he said, you're ugly as well, all those sort of things. <laughs> well... <laughs> don't write them down, tick them off. <laughs> anyway... After all these, uh, seriously, a lady came on the line who was very obviously upset, and Vic asked the lady what was upsetting her, and she said that her size made her feel, and I remember the, the actual words she used were worthless and disgusting. And Vic said to her, well, you mustn't, you're a person, you're a human being. And that was typical of Victoria, so lovely and warm. So, speaking of warm, onto the man whose nightclub I burnt down in Phoenix Nights. <laughs> How about that for a link? Ladies and gentlemen, one of Victoria Wood's greatest fans and a fellow Lancastrian, Mr Peter Kay, with a very special tribute. <laughs> you caught me. <laughs> Hi, Victoria. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be there tonight. Why am I shouting? 
But uh, as you can see, I'm busy working. Uh, Gladiator the musical. I did a bomb show when I found out it were Russell Crowe, but I'd already sold my house at that point. Ah, well, only another six weeks. With plenty of tickets left. About three and a half thousand, actually. <laughs> As you probably know, you've always been an inspiration to me. I've followed your career now over the years with a pen and paper. A scene on TV, Pat and Margaret, Dinner Ladies, I think that's everything. Oh, and one Cal. Can't forget the biggie. I can honestly say, Victoria, that without you, I wouldn't be here where I am tonight. I had a leisure centre in Cockermouth. <laughs> a BAFTA tribute to all VW, Victoria Wood. And you know, you're like a VW in so many ways to me. You're, you're reliable, you're tough, and you can tow a caravan. <laughs> Have a great night, you deserve it. And uh, I hope your new musical turns out to be more of a success than this. And I'll see you soon. Ta-ra! Awooga! I've got to do a serious bit now. <laughs> There's so much empathy in Victoria's writing. No, there is. There's so much empathy in Victoria's writing. She understands her audience so well. I know it's a cliche, but she really does have the ability to make an audience cry, make them laugh, make them cry again. And just as they're drying their tears, well, she'll make them laugh once again. This is a small example of that skill. Do you knock or not? I didn't know. <laughs> they don't tell you that one, do they? Magazines. <laughs> Do you knock on hotel door of famous sister you haven't seen for 27 years? Victoria is the Lancashire equivalent of Alan Bennett. I mean, and I can give her no higher praise than that. She has the same wonderful fine ear for dialogue. She has some of the qualities that Alan Bennett has. She has lots of qualities that Alan Bennett doesn't have. <laughs> and, but uh, there's a kind of clear, sympathetic truthfulness about her. I've loved you since the first minute you gave me extra gravy. You've given me care and comfort and a wonderful sex life. Come here. A sex life? You've had a sex life? Where have you had it? On your bed. Not on the Ida down. I've only come on the till today. I were in meat packing before, then an overall come free, so come here. <laughs> Surely you wear an overall when you're packing meat. No, you just bring something from home. I had our dog's blanket. <laughs> Hello, I'm Victoria Wood. Welcome to Santa Monica. When I lived in England and was the star of such hit comedies as Wood and Waters and The Lunch Ladies, I was overweight and could not even look in a mirror. Those monologues that she does, those carefully, tightly scripted monologues that appear to be just her chatting. It's a great skill. It's a gift. Oh, text message. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Connie! Connie! Step into the left. No, no, to your left. No, to your left. No, because you're actually hurting her foot doing that. <laughs> no, it's just a little survey. No, we're not selling anything. No, it's totally bona fide. <laughs> I think she invented, as far as I can see, remember the sort of mock documentary. But I've got a very, very clear image of that one where she played a girl who swum the channel. But what about finding the French coast? I think I'll find it all right, thank you. I came fourth in geography. <laughs> what time is it? Uh, 7.55. 5 to 8. Off I go then. And that sort of feeling of real, absurd people caught on camera is what most modern, good television comedy television is now, and Victoria was doing it more than a decade ago. May I ask what you're doing here? We've come about to test your babies and that. We want to test your baby. Why? Are there problems? We've only got a maze net, so a little tiny test you. <laughs> she, she, she gives herself great lines, uh, but she also gives all the other characters at work with the great lines. My name's Kitty. I could have married, I've given gallons of blood, and I can't stomach whelk, so that's me for you. <laughs> We'd like to apologise to viewers in the North. It must be awful for them. <laughs> Why can't I join the Women's Institute? Is it because I'm a man? You were let down by your rhubarb and ginger preserve. It's too runny to stay on the scone. Good day to you, Mrs. Cottesloe. Miss Tweed. I cannot think you and I can have any reason for bandage. Badinage. <laughs> I was 
Christmas lunch in the Cratchit's house in Christmas Carol, and it was very, very funny. And we were all laughing the whole time we were doing it. Cock, the biggest turkey in the Polteras. Now Tiny Tim will be well again. Is it defrosted? 